think of the billions of man hours that necessarily had to go in to build those walls over a very, very long period. It's an awesome thing and nobody, nobody has written about it or looked at it in that sense. And it's so sad. As I said, if they were piled high in the form of a monument, they'd be one of the seven wonders of the world. But because it's spread around and nobody, and surely some, in, well, I'm sure they will, they will one day scratch their head and say, you know, let's do some numbers on this. And like a linear mile or, you know, average length, and come up with a rough estimate of how many stones there are in East Galway. You know, and now you're talking about a culture that, that must have necessarily extended over probably five or more centuries, or millennia. So this is something that's very deep and felt very, very deeply. And it's not at all surprising that the land war and the, um, the, the, uh, the, um, the land league started right there in the heart of that, war, that country. You know it well as a tour guide, Robert, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly how it's like, you go on and on and on with those, even just the road between Galway and Chum. You know, you're surrounded on both sides of the road by this massive, massive, and the, the Burks, the, the Burka family, which later became McWilliams, they anglicized, or not, sorry, they Gaelicized their name from the Burka to McWilliam, and then you had the McWilliam titles and so on. But anyway, that was the, the, um, the, the, um, uh, but what, but to get back to what you want, Robert, about the segue and the, the, um, the, um, the, um, what's the third one? Purchase or uh, sales, sale, fair price? What was the, what was the third? Pardon? What's the third one? What is the we'll get I'll get in a second. I'll get in a second. I'll get in a second. My God. Um, <laughs> um, the anyway, uh, I'm kind of fascinated with those two because I can see um, their um, uh, their uh, coming through after the centuries of um, uh, dispossession, and then. They largely succeeded um, through um, the concept of the boycott, which was named, as, as you know, uh, after a, um, an English uh, small landlord called Captain Boycott <coughs> um, from East Anglia. He went back to East Anglia. Um, again, if you were to see his um, estate, uh, if you want to call it that, um, the land that he owned outside Ballon Robe, uh, it's like absolutely smack dab in the middle of uh, these little fields, which truly are an awesome thing. And if you've ever heard the fields of Athen Rye, so the, 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 the artistic, the modern artistic people in Ireland are aware of this. It's not unsurprising that one of the most popular songs in the last few decades has been the fields of Athen Rye. And Athen Rye uh, is again smack dab in the middle of that territory, that that world of the small little fields, um, those, those small fertilized fields. And in a large scale, they're surrounded by mountains, so that you think of all of Connemara and all the mountains of Mayo and so on, where they could literally haul. By the way, they also hauled seaweed, uh, as they f the, the movie The Field demonstrated. So fertilizing these fields was a very important part of the, the labor of the day. But <clears throat> anyway, uh, it was um, only appropriate that the actual demise of the English landlord system literally took place or took root in the beginnings right there in that area. And it's also a great credit to Charles Stuart Parnell, who was a landlord himself from Wicklow, certainly not a man of the land, in small land, but yet he understood Irish history and understood the Irish persona. He, his mother was American, and he was, of course, from a very old Irish family in the, um, in the East Coast, but nevertheless. But he had the foresight and the political acumen to go down to Westport and actually take charge of the movement. And he made a great 
uh, contribution in that he said, with the great authority of, of him being the leader of the Irish party in Westminster. And that was a very important, uh, he was a very important part of the Westminster, the House of Commons. And he said to them famously in Westport, a great rally, keep a firm hold on your land. Was that his exact words? Keep t keep a firm hold on your land, um, and of course he got right to the hearts of the people, and they never really then people never actually ever ever gave up on him. The the, the the church did, and all the other upper class people and the petites, the people never did, because they knew he understood what the land meant to them, and when he said that, it was a words for all time, if you like. He had their hearts forever, and he did. And he always went back there to sort of renew himself. And he was actually on his way. He had just come from there when he went down. And in those days, you traveled by steamy old train and down to Brighton and died in Brighton, um, literally having come back from the west, west of Ireland, Balladrine. But <clears throat> uh, so then as the, 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 the whatever you want to call it, the reawakening started to really catch on towards the end of the uh, 19th century in the form of the Home Rule Movement, the Land League Movement, uh, the Celtic Dawn, you know, the, the reawakening of uh, the, 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 um, li the literary movement and so on. Um, it all kind of started to, it was like a natural, it's like a flo like blossoming back out again. It was kind of amazing, really, that the poets came back out. It was like springtime, you know, uh, and the land, and all of these things happened. And almost, almost like a natural phenomenon, almost like something coming straight out of the land. Um, and, um, <clears throat> Culminating, of course, in as you know, the 1916 uh, rebellion. Again, uh, probably more the heart of which in the was Park Pierce, who again uh, made the the expression of um, watering the rose tree. It was very much a a natural thing, only he said, we have to water it with our own blood. So the idea of nurturing something coming out of the land with the, them was incredibly ingrained in Park Pierce. He understood that in all his poetry. And what's nice about Park Pierce is he wrote in the Gaelic tongue, and he wrote it beautifully, even though his father was an Englishman, but his mother was an Irishman, an Irish woman. And again, you know, the Irish are very, they're very sort of, they very adopt, adopt very easily like that, um, so he had that, um, and W. B. Yeats had it, but unfortunately, he had to use the English tongue because he was uh, from the English um, planter class, if you like. But he had a great, uh, or at least he acquired a great uh, knowledge and understanding of the um, the Irish language. Douglas Hyde was probably the best example of. Uh, the, 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 the English that was left in Ireland now becoming almost more Irish than the Irish themselves because he again was the son of a, a Protestant minister who grew up on uh, what could be described as mensal land uh, in that they had a domain which was, went, went, went with the vicarage. <coughs> um, what's the matter? You have a question? Okay, wonderful. What did the land actually do? What did it actually do? What did it do? What, 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 well, what was it? Well, of course, it was um, a, a popular browns up uh, a movement of tenant farmers. Uh, it was um, a formal association of tenant farmers um, formed a bit like a trade union but uh, different in that it was 
dedicated to achieving reform of land ownership. And they used the word land league, I guess because it was understood in, by then, English, English speaking world, because remember the English had spent the, almost the entire 1900s in destroying the Irish language. So mostly, even a lot of the better off Irish peasantry spoke English. Um, but it was, it was a, um, an association of tenant farmers. And a lot of the songs was, you know, hooray for the bold tenant farmer and everything. So it was a tenant farmer mode. Did people apply to this organization to get land? No. No. No, because it was a, a, essentially a political action committee, a political action group. It was similar to a lot of the ones that we have today, like the environmentalist movement and so on, which is a special interest group. So no, it didn't have any um, legal authority.